This is a very overdue video. My review on the Olympus 100 to 400 millimeter lens for astrophotography. I was one of the very earliest people to actually get this lens. Okay, I put my order out very early and shortly thereafter everyone kind of figured out that this was a great lens and they quickly sold out on them. And I think just now, here we are about eight months later, the Olympus is finally starting to catch up with production on this lens. And some of that has to do with the global, you know, what's going on. But uh, it's mainly because, you know, it has sold like crazy, okay? Because this is a fantastic piece of equipment. I originally bought this lens to take on an elk hunt, okay? And there was something that was rather tragic that happened to me. Of course, the first thing I was doing was testing this thing out to see how it would perform in astrophotography. And... I accidentally plugged my dew heater into the wrong type of outlet and as a result it overheated and I started smelling something and I could smell something about 20 yards away from this and it was this lens and it was melting, okay? <laughs> so when I contacted Olympus and said, I need to send this lens in to be repaired, they were like, what? We just sent these lenses out. This has not been on the market like for more than a few days. And so yeah, I was basically the first person in the world to need to get this lens repaired. It was $580 to get it repaired, but it has been completely worth it. You know, even the price tag of this thing, it has been a fantastic lens. I've enjoyed using it for landscape. I've enjoyed using it for pictures of my kid. I've enjoyed using it for wildlife and especially astrophotography. And that, okay, is something that a lot of people are surprised by. They think that an F6.3 lens is too slow for astrophotography, uh, especially with an Olympus camera. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. Okay, I found that f6.3 was completely adequate. As a matter of fact, the telescope that I've been using for the last three years, the refractor, okay, is an f6.3 refractor. So this basically gave me more focal lengths to choose from and really was, there was no difference in speed. Now, it has lots of ED glass in it, chromatic aberrations in it are very well suppressed. This lens is quite sharp. I've taken pictures and gone back and retaken photographs that I've taken with other optical glass in the past, and I must say that this thing far exceeds any of the previous pieces of equipment that I've tried to use. Now, let's talk about that aperture really quick. So, this is a variable aperture lens. It ranges from f5 to f6.3. However, if you're going to use this for astrophotography, basically think of it and treat it as a f6.3 lens throughout because that's the aperture that I recommend using it at. At the 100 millimeter focal length at f5, you're going to get a little bit of coma and stopping it down to f6.3 will get rid of that. All right, so think of it as an f6.3 lens throughout its range and you'll be fine. You'll have nice tack sharp stars all the way to the edge. When I was tracking stars with this, all right, because this is obviously heavy, okay, it is, it is a bigger piece of equipment, I was actually using the piggyback method, which is where I actually have this thing on top of my refractor, which is also of 6.3, and I was using the refractor to basically guide with the stars and then taking pictures with this using an intervalometer, an external intervalometer actually. And from that, I was actually able to capture some really incredible images. And one of the annoying things about where I live, I live in a Bortle 6 sky, okay? So I have a lot of light pollution to deal with. But the beauty of shooting deep sky objects, you know, objects that are, you know, more than 200 millimeter focal length or longer, is that because of the narrower field of view that this lens will have, gradients aren't as big of an issue because here in the city you know if I try to do wide-angle astrophotography it's just so hard to to process out all of that gradient okay but because this guy's got a longer focal length you know I I feel very confident using it even here in my backyard to photograph you know brighter objects things like the Pleiades things like Orion uh, even the California Nibla is a target that I should have tried to get but didn't, and I will next year, but uh, the North American Nebula is coming up soon and I'll be definitely hot on that thing's trail with this lens. But yeah, I definitely recommend this lens if you do want to do astrophotography with it. It gives you a lot of different focal lengths that you can work with, and like I said, it's very sharp at its maximum aperture of f6.3. And 
yeah, I'm very pleased with it. It cost me about two grand total because I had to get it repaired that one time, but I would definitely not go back. Okay, so this lens, I'm using an EM1 Mark III, all right? Most of you, if you're fortunate to have that camera, this camera will actually focus on stars with this lens, no problem. Here's an interesting thing, okay? Because this thing is such a long focal length, I was actually able to focus using regular EM1 Mark II, which does not have starry sky autofocus on things like planets, okay? So it's a long focal length, all right? And it does get you quite a bit of magnification. I wish that we'd had some clear skies when there was that conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, because in this lens it probably would look pretty neat, but unfortunately the weather did not cooperate with me, so yeah. But that was an interesting discovery and I thought I'd pass it on to you that this thing's got a long enough focal length that, yeah, it will actually focus on some stars, you know, even if you do not have the starry sky autofocus feature. All right, so let's talk about this thing. It is a beautiful lens. It has mostly a metal body. There are some pieces of plastic on it though. I know this portion right here is all metal. This is metal. The zoom rings though and the autofocus ring, or the main focus ring I should say, these are plastic, right? And there's no slip forward and back clutch that kind of engages that artificial manual focus, but it's okay. And then of course, if you zoom the lens out further, of course, this portion right here is also plastic, which is what I melted. But up here, the bezel, it is metal, in fact. And of course, the lens hood, it's plastic. It's a simple lens hood. It reverses and goes over the lens like so. And it's pretty compact. I like it. And I always try to keep a lens hood in position when I can, because something like this kind of protects the front lens element. All right, let's talk a little bit about the tripod mount. So one thing that I like about the tripod mount is not only does it have this Arca Swiss groove in it, it also sits a little bit farther from the lens center of the body. This is nice because I've noticed that with my Skywatcher Adventurer, I have one other lens that has a tripod mount on it, and that's my 40 to 150 f2.8. And it's quite a bit closer to the lens center. And as a result, my battery grip tends to hit the Skywatcher Adventure Pro quite a bit. So I have to be really careful about the orientation with that lens. With this lens, that's not as big a deal because it's further away from the center of the lens axis. But it's a nice, it's a nice beefy thing and yeah, it will definitely do the job. I also like some of the features that are on the side. We have image stabilization on and off switch right here. Autofocus and manual focus button. And some people actually prefer these over the clutch system that's built into the, some of the lenses. And most of the Proline lenses have that clutch in the focus ring itself, which is, it's fast, it's handy. However, I've noticed sometimes that it's pretty easy to flip this on and off when you don't want to. Something like this is quite a bit more secure. And for astrophotography, I would say that it's a bit more of an advantage to have a switch like this. Also, of course, you've got the typical limiters here for close focus, the entire range, and then mostly six meters and on into infinity. For astrophotography, obviously, you would want to be on the six meters to infinity option. And then, of course, there is a lock right here. And this is actually the only complaint that I have about the entire lens. I really, really, really wish that this lock worked at every single focal length. Unfortunately, it only works at the 100 millimeter focal length, it will not work at any of the other focal lengths. Uh, hopefully, maybe someday Olympus will come out with a new version of this. And Olympus, if you're watching, could you make this lock work at all focal lengths? Or maybe like have it work at each of the numbers that are here. So let's say you'd switch it to 150 millimeters and there you could lock it. You'd switch it to 200 millimeters and there you can lock it. That's just me being wishful thinking because when this thing is elevated and pointed up at the sky, there's always kind of worry about this thing would slide back through time. However, the, uh, the lens is pretty well dampened and uh, I don't really see that ever maybe being an issue, at least not in the like first couple years. Um, because maybe if this thing wears, we shall see with time. But right now it's plenty stiff enough that I set it at 200 and I pointed up at the sky. It's gonna stay there, it's not really gonna unzoom itself okay 
but you know that's just something you know I wish that that was lockable that would make taking flats a lot easier because then I could match the focal length a lot easier all right one last thing before I actually start showing you photos that I've taken with this so a lot of people have been asking me about the fit of the camera to the actual lens itself on the bayonet and I know there's been a couple different threads out there on dpreview.com about this. And basically what it does is it boils down to is production variances in the little, the peg hole here basically that causes the lens to stop rotating on the camera body. And it's really not something to be concerned about as far as like optical quality goes because the rotation of the lens on the camera body isn't really something to worry about because there are no baffles in this as far as I know that could cause vignetting. I took all these pictures at my local observatory using the piggyback method, kind of like you see here, and it's a Bortle 5 sky. Now first up, this is Andromeda. This is a big object in the sky. This is, the lens was set to 400 millimeters here, aperture all the way wide open. I was using 180 second exposures, so those are three minute exposures. Stacked them together, I think I took 32. And as you can see with the Olympus EM1 Mark III, you know, it nails the focus nice and perfect. And yeah, it's, it's a great picture. I'm really proud of this. Now this picture right here is the tragedy. This is the picture that I was actually taking while my lens was melting because my dew heater was, you know, plugged in the wrong outlet. So as you can see, it's, it looks really bad. You know, the stars are bloated and everything, but still it's an incredible picture. And then next up, this is the one I'm really proud of. This is the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades M45. And this is kind of a difficult target to take because those stars are extremely bright. But as you can see here, they're not that bloated. The pictures that I've taken previously using a 50 to 200 millimeter lens from Olympus, the, the, the stars were just gigantic, okay? They were these huge waffles. Here, they're much better rendered. And uh, I was just kind of, this is really cool that you know you can get this much detail out of a zoom lens like this and yeah it's the perfect focal length for this target as well I want to show you a couple things in the sky using Stellarium that you can photograph with this now we're using an EM1 sensor size and I've got this thing set to a 100 millimeter focal length and as you can see here, this is the Witch's Head Nebula. This, this would be a pretty neat target to photograph. And you would not need a modified camera to do this. You will need a darker sky though. But as you can see, it would frame up quite nicely in this. And if I switch to like, let's say the 200 millimeter focal length, it'll just barely fit the whole thing. And then if we switch to like the 400 millimeter focal length, uh, basically we're gonna be like zoomed right into like the head of the Witch's Head. You know, so pretty neat target. I do want to try to hit this next year. Now let's kind of zoom back out again here and just show you a few of the other targets. Uh, this is right here. This is that one target that I kind of failed to capture at 400 millimeters. It frames up the flame nebula and the horse head nebula great. And Alan attack is typically called the dog star. Uh, I think that's what the name actually means. This star typically kind of blows out most of these images but as you could see even while that lens was melting it was able to kind of suppress and you know keep this area under control so let's switch back to the 100 millimeter focal length again you know here's here's the uh the rosette nebula look at that that would actually fill this perfectly i definitely need to try and hit that target next year um let's go back up here this these are some things that are higher up in the sky uh, a lot of these are much fainter objects. It would be a little bit harder to difficult, more difficult to like kind of capture these. So let's kind of zoom out here. Oop, a little too far. And let's kind of advance the time to more. Uh, this is the winter sky or spring sky. And now here we are in the summer. This is the summer sky. So the Milky Way is overhead. This is actually what's going on right now when I'm filming this. And let's kind of zoom in a little bit. I'll show you some of the things that you can kind of try to capture. At the 100 millimeter focal length, this particular section of the sky, this is right in the head of Scorpio. And you know what, let me turn on the constellation so you can kind of see. Yeah, so right there's the head of Scorpio. This is the neck. 
this is a pretty neat target to try to hit at the 100 millimeter focal length. A faster lens might be a little bit better and you're gonna need a pretty dark sky because a lot of the objects in here are kind of a little bit faint but they're, uh, they won't, you will not need a modified camera to kind of photograph this, this stuff. And then up here, now this is going to be a fun one. I'm definitely going to try this one this spring. This is the pair M8, the Lagoon Nebula, and then up here, the Tri-Fi Nebula, I believe. 400 millimeter focal length will actually frame both of these up almost perfectly. And really, I could probably even zoom out a little bit. And then up in the sky a little bit further, there's a couple of other things in the sky that are pretty neat to try to capture. We have this object, this is the Omega Nebula. And then let's see if I can try it. This is the Eagle Nebula right here. And this would actually be kind of a neat target to try to hit at 400 millimeters. So that's kind of the, the spring, summer type sky. And then of course, this right here is what I was telling you about earlier. This is the, uh, the North American Nebula, which is a pretty cool target. This is at 200 millimeters right now. And it would frame just about the whole thing along with the Pelican Nebula nicely. And then of course you could try to get, oh, come on. You could probably try to get the wall, which is in this area right here with the 400 millimeter focal length. I know the red box that I have is kind of getting lost in all this nebulosity. Let me zoom out a little bit. 200 might work pretty good. And then the Veil Nebula at 200 millimeters would be a pretty neat target to try to photograph. These are, I do believe you don't really necessarily need a modified camera to photograph these targets. But I know that star right there is typically pretty bright. But, you know, with, like, like I talked about earlier, the, resender, the rendering power of this lens is very good. And I think it will be able to suppress that star quite well. So that's it. There's a ton of things in the sky, really, that you can start photographing with this lens. And it's a really fun lens to use, a fun lens to use for wildlife. And that's kind of really what I mainly got it for. But, of course, I'm using it for astrophotography. And I'm doing that with a lot of success.